Yeah. to see you um, and to know that this is your big day of completing your doctoral program, which is amazing. Congratulations. Um, Thank you so much. And we have a number of TAM students in the room here joining by Zoom together, which is a really um, great thing. Of course, that we're here in person, some of us on Zoom, but many of us in person because we were expecting a prospective applicant and so they're, they're showing their support in potentially meeting her, but she's not here at the moment. Um, so thank you for being here in person. And we're looking forward to um, hearing your introduction from Marie, Aditi, and Michael. And thank you so much for interacting with them this week, your busy week already. And I just wanna say it's always a pleasure to welcome a TAM grad back, even if it has to be on the screen. Um, and we've had a number of grads come through town or join us on Zoom this semester in the lecture series and outside of the lecture series. And it just makes everything more fun and meaningful. So thank you so much for um, doing this for us and sharing in your big moment. I turn it over to the TAM students. Hi, everybody. I'm Aditi. Um, I'm thrilled to introduce Dr. Saragul Nguyen. Uh, TAM class of 2011 today. Um, Sergal has an amazing career graph, so I'm gonna quickly try to summarize all of it so that we can hear directly from her. Um, she got her BA in sociology from Boazici University in Istanbul in 2009. During her undergrad, she was able to come to UNC for an exchange semester, and she fell in love with the campus and the classes she took in the political science department. She then came to TAM and studied at Sciences Po Paris, graduating in 2011. After that, she worked as a TV journalist for CNN Turk for two and a half years, starting with reporting on the ground for Istanbul News, then widening her scope to foreign news and completing her stint by working on the foreign news desk. She then worked in corporate communication and lectured at the University of Applied Sciences Utrecht in the Netherlands, where her husband currently lectures and does research. And since 2015, she has been working on her PhD in communication and media studies at Galatasaray University in Istanbul, while continuing to lecture at Erasmus University in Rotterdam. She said her PhD took over her life, so she doesn't have time for many hobbies, but before her life was overtaken by her degree, she enjoyed yoga, biking, and watching K-dramas. She's going to talk more about the contents of her thesis later, but I just want to shout out again that she actually defended her thesis earlier today. So congratulations again, Sergal, and thank you for making time for us. Hopefully you can relax now and start learning ceramics like you mentioned you wanted to. Thank you so much for this sweet introduction. Uh, it really summarizes well what we've discussed this week, right? Um, I'm really honored. It's a great pleasure for me to to be uh, right now as a, as a guest lecturer to, to the lecture series that I barely remember from 10 years ago. Um, so thanks, uh, thank you so much, uh, Sarah and uh, the whole group for inviting me uh, to, to this uh, uh, lecture uh, series. Of thank the, you so much. Do, do you have more to add, Michael and Marie? Yes, they have just a little bit more to brag about you about. Yeah, sure, <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> So uh, while Sergal um, was at UNC, she had the pleasure of experiencing football seasons as well as Chapel Hill Halloweens. She cites outings at South Point as a highlight of her time in North Carolina, where she dined alongside fellow students at the Hidden Gem of Durham, the Cheesecake Factory. Um, another distinct memory of hers, in addition to the pumpkin cheesecake, is one that transports her back to her days as a Tar Heel. Ingrained in the furthest depths of her subconscious, the Yosta Epsing Anderson's iconic red book, The Three Worlds of Welfare Capitalism. Speaking of the welfare state, she recalls the TAM reception at Professor Stevens' house, where he gave a speech to his colleagues and students while perched atop a chair 
When asked about an aspect of TAM she considered to be crucial outside of academics, Serga lauded Sarah as well as her guidance as a top factor and could not imagine her TAM experience without her. And now that we know a little bit more about Sir Gould, we can talk about some of the research that I think is really interesting, I guess, as the resident Anglophile in TAM this year. Her PhD thesis is titled Between Cosmopolitan and National Outlook, the BBC World News is coverage of the Syrian refugee crisis, which is about how the British media framed this event for international consumption. Hope I'm not giving too much away, but the BBC is a great example of how modern media and companies are trying to globalize, and not only because the BBC has been reaching out to worldwide audiences for almost 100 years through the BBC World Service, but today they're doing so on limited budgets with a lot of political pressure that um, has some domestic BBC reporters also appearing on the international side, and a lot of times I copy and paste some of these news packages in for the international uh, viewers. And we're seeing other countries do that as well. Uh, France 24, Deutsche Welle, uh, they cover news in France and Germany that probably require an above average understanding or knowledge of their respective domestic affairs, but they're clearly produced for English speaking if not explicitly American uh, audiences as their target, target demographic. And now I will paraphrase another paragon of British broadcasting and welcome and introduce this week's star baker reporting live from Istanbul. Please welcome Tam Alam and newly minted Dr. Sergul Nyang. Thank you so much, uh, Michael, Editi, and Marine uh, for this beautiful introduction. Um, yeah, I'm really happy to, to start right ahead uh, to, to talk more about uh, these uh, points that this Michael just um, talked about. Let me share uh, my screen, if you will. Um, yeah, and that's actually a picture from this morning, <laughs> me graduating. Um, I'm still, I guess, PhD high uh, from, from that. Uh, and please don't mind me if I um, look at my notes a little bit today because of, um, yeah, I, it's always uh, good um, to, 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 to focus on, on the actual content I'm really happy about uh, today. Yes, um, and 10 years after being, uh, with you um, is, is a real uh, pleasure. So yes, the title of my thesis is this, um, and this is what I'm going to talk about today. Um, so the BBC World News uh, framing of the uh, refugee uh, crisis, and um, I will walk you through the theories that I use, the methods that I did. Um, so it's gonna be actually pretty similar to what, what I discussed this morning, um, but uh, a bit more hopefully bringing you closer um, and a bit more interesting hopefully. And um, sharing the screen is always a bit, yeah, I don't see you right now, but I will stop at some point and um, please also stop me whenever uh, you have questions um, or we can save it to, to the end uh, in, the, in the question and answers. Um, so let me begin. Um, I skipped this part because I was introduced pretty uh, nicely. Uh, yeah, I do uh, now. Um, well, I am a lecturer at Erasmus University Rotterdam for now nearly two years. And um, my research basically that I started in Istanbul today uh, and my PhD came to an end. Um, it was a topic that always attracted my attention. Um, the Syrian refugee crisis also as being from uh, Turkey. Um, that was actually a crisis that was um, mediatized a lot. It was right, um, in, we, we were bordering by Turkey to, to Syria. So that was actually huge right from the very first times 10 years ago. And the conflict as uh, you all know in Syria has been raging on for 10 years now. When, displaced uh, millions of refugees from their homes, um, while the social and political aftermath of the Middle Eastern revolutions are ambiguous and complex, it's connected, especially in the Syrian case, uh, to one of the most massive migration movements in recent history. And it is still going on, right? These days we see in the news uh, Afghan uh, refugee crisis, for instance. It, um, it's one of the crises that's, uh, that are that on the media. And one could argue that the scenes like this, which is very familiar to, I'm sure to many of you, uh, that these scenes, uh, one could argue uh, that of the Syrian conflict and the entailed refugee crisis have become staples in uh, hard news across international uh, media outlets during this time. Um, you also in, uh, 
in the media protests, for instance, right, authoritarian violence, destroyed cities, raw combat footage, other things, atrocities, chemical weapons, ISIS, um, and maybe most memorably, actually, these pictures of refugees on boats, on the shore, uh, on foot, at border checkpoints, at the very vulnerable moments that they were going through uh, in their makeshift camps, on the streets, sometimes barely alive um, and dead. Uh, so that's uh, basically what makes this uh, actually uh, a staple for news, because it is a negative news. And I'll talk about the news values and what makes news also in a bit. But simply put, um, news media play an important role um, in the formation of public opinion in many migrant receiving countries, uh, because that is of attention uh, from wherever um, news media is reporting. Um, the immediate impact on the, on the region, on the, on the countries uh, in question because of the audiences that they target, um, that's very important. Um, so, uh, in the way that they can uh, form public opinion, media has a lot of power actually still to this day. Uh, journalists have that authoritarian uh, voice, uh, and especially uh, for channels like BBC World News uh, that attract, attract a lot of uh, audiences, uh, their framing of the crisis is also quite important. Um, most people actually, right, any uh, of us uh, audiences, um, which is very difficult to actually define uh, when it comes to an international or a cosmopolitan audience, they have little or no direct experiences with uh, refugees, but they learn about their stories through uh, the heavily visualized reports such as this um, and narratives that journalists provide them with. Um, and here visual framing uh, is essential to how audiences imagine and think about developments, issues, conflict, as such uh, or crises uh, that take place in, in, a, in a perceived distance from themselves. So these are not happening when you look at it from uh, the, the European perspective, right? These are uh, unusual uh, scenes. These are not uh, scenes that you see in your daily life uh, if you live uh, in continental Europe or in Britain, uh, but these are basically some suffering, uh, some human suffering that happens at a distant place. Um, and the news reports actually, and especially um, what I'm interested in, the news media packages, um, are, are quite interesting in, in visualizing this, this crisis. So they have um, uh, access to the world at large uh, through the media, all these audiences that I just spoke about. Um, and uh, these reports have a, a huge importance in the construction of, of reality. So news framing theory is uh, one of my main uh, theoretical background that I use uh, in my research. And why? Because um, well, framing theory is very complex and um, it actually occurs at many uh, levels. Um, so choices made by media organizations and journalists are key to the news framing processes, how they present issues in particular ways, select and emphasize certain aspects while excluding other information, because um, what you, what's the journalist reports is important and yeah, there's some frame that occurs within, but also the non-selection, right? So what is not being reported is equally important and that's everything is within this uh, framing. Um, so this is um, uh, Derise's uh, 2005 uh, article that uh, he basically um, a scholar who have written a lot on, on framing. Um, this shows how uh, it occurs first in the newsroom uh, as a process, uh, which is affected by uh, internal factors and external factors, uh, meaning yeah, which society uh, you live in, for instance, in Britain, Ofcom is one of these external factors um, when you think about the regulations and so on. Frames in the news is particularly what I'm interested in, and that was also easiest to, to research because it's more difficult to get access to newsrooms usually. Uh, you need to do participant observations, spend a lot of time. Frames in the news is actually um, if uh, one has access to data, meaning in this case, in my research is news video packages, um, you could um, do content analysis with them and very rigor rigorously um, form a cold book and then 
in light with the research questions, of course, and um, analyze these uh, videos. And that's actually quite an objective way of approaching uh, research rather than going and asking uh, just uh, to editors, for instance, or journalists. Uh, but looking at the news itself first, uh, actually, it, it, I, I gained a lot of ground doing this first. Uh, then I spoke to journalists, but I'll come to that uh, later on. And framing also has um, effects parts, so um, which is, which happens more on the audience side. Basically, that also um, gives us a very basic. Um, assumption in, um, and that was a huge discussion in journalism studies, basically, that audiences are, and also in cultural studies, audiences are not passive receivers, right? Um, there are frames in the media, but it doesn't mean that audiences will uh, take these frames as they are. So media frames versus audience frames. And here, what we see, framing effects, is more about the psychological impact, right? So how we process that information, as audience um, and um, how do we change our attitudes and uh, or better we change our attitudes and behaviors uh, in regards to the information that we receive. So that part is audience. Uh, we could only uh, research this with audience research. And in my thesis, that was out of uh, the scope of my research. So I only focused actually on frames in the news. And the framing in the newsroom part, I only relied uh, by asking um, journalists um, on how they reflect on their own um, framing practices and the, the way that they gather news and they uh, treat the news and so on. So that's framing. And my research questions. So um, uh, I will speak about um, other uh, parts of the theory, but first let me introduce actually what uh, the actual questions that I have in mind uh, in this research. So how does the BBC World News frame the Syrian refugee crisis in uh, video news packages? Uh, second, to what extent do the BBC World News packages on the Syrian refugee crisis reflect a cosmopolitan vision? Uh, so we'll speak about that in a bit. How do journalists perceive their own practices in TV reporting about crises. And that revealed actually quite a lot of um, information um, in regards to foreign news reporting and went actually beyond uh, just Syrian refugee crisis. So that was also pretty interesting. And the research problem that um, basically I proposed and I spotted uh, was that BBC World News frame uh, the Syrian refugee crisis in their allegedly global news content. Uh, so they do claim a global outlook, and that's actually um, uh, pretty much announced in their um, website, in their uh, mission and visions, in their um, editorial guidelines. Um, but rather than a cosmopolitan outlook, actually the BBC World News approach news from a more uh, parochial and national outlook. So that's basically my uh, proposition, the, the research problem that I see. So few studies are uh, available on the limits of cosmopolitan outlook in respect to the coverage of distant suffering and journalist practices while covering a humanitarian crisis, namely the Syrian refugee crisis. So that, that's also why I want to contribute to this gap. Um, and that's uh, why I chose to, to actually to, uh, to begin uh, researching this. So framing crises. Uh, so we talked about framing theory already and uh, framing crises in the news um, uh, also requires us to understand a little bit more about uh, what is a crisis, right? So I do use the word crisis also in my title, right? But crisis is actually something that is uh, that has turned into a discourse of crisis by the media. So, and also that's also taken uh, from the political discourse. So crisis um, has a lot of definition, of course, but I won't share uh, them all here. Uh, but talking about a crisis implies that a society uh, has reached a turning point. So that's uh, basically one of the definitions that I like. Um, and it comes from Bauman and uh, Bordoni's uh, book on, on crisis. So that's, um, uh, and this implication of a turning point uh, from a journalistic viewpoint uh, leads to pre-mediation. Uh, 
And pre-mediation is basically um, a virtual play uh, through of all imaginable, uh, imaginable scenarios around an event and issue. And journalists do that actually constantly. So they don't just report what just happened, but they also try to understand what may happen in the, in the future. And crisis basically is very much prone to doing this because um, uh, only then uh, they can make sense of uh, of, of this, right, which is something new, which is unpredictable. And, um, and in that case, that's also what makes journalists as sense makers, right? Um, so they do pre-mediate and they do interpret what they have information in hand and they do uh, try to guess what might happen. Crisis also can, crisis framing can fuel, so basically the crisis framing in the news can fuel pre-existing anxieties and fears over the unbeknownst in the, in the society. And that, again, it's very much has to do with understanding what uh, audience that they have in mind, right? And because otherwise the pre-existing anxieties and fears won't fit with, um, with a broad audience. So uh, many journalists uh, working, especially for public broadcasters, um, they do have a national audience in mind first. Um, so they do know about um, right, the domestic uh, coverage a lot, of course, even if they are foreign news correspondents, mainly the interviewees that I spoke to, they are aware of domestic uh, politics, audiences, what attracts um, the national audience's attention. Uh, which is um, which seem to be uh, also with the interviews their primary um, uh, customers. So that's uh, even the, that word was uh, used by some of my interviewees. Uh, so they do um, feel um, that uh, anxiety or fear, um, and that's also goes actually beyond that kind of understanding of the national audience, but. The early 21st century uh, was marked by uh, invasive security policies that were promoted as a reaction uh, to the perceived threat of global terrorism, um, which also connected to a surge in racist sentiments, um, not just uh, in Europe, but elsewhere as well, right, in, in, in America as well, uh, which uh, that's the post 9-11 environment that I'm uh, speaking about, uh, where um, there is a general fear of the non-Western, other quote unquote in many European uh, societies and in North America as well. Um, so current challenges posed by migration from the uh, Middle East uh, fall here into a continuum that started already before 9-11 and it only uh, became um, that discourse uh, intensified basically and um, news framing also is affected by that um, public uh, discourse. Um, and finally, crisis uh, framing also contributes to the securitization of, of the migration uh, issue uh, in public discourse based on that logic of uh, admission versus rejection of refugees and asylum seekers. Um, so uh, Bauman uh, has a very small book uh, about that and it's very uh, interesting actually, I would uh, recommend um, you reading if you're interested in, in migration issues. Um, that's uh, really refreshing. Um, it's, it is um, uh, quite interesting how refugees are framed based on this uh, logic also in the news. So um, journalists are not by themselves create frames, uh, for instance, right? They pick up also the frames that are already existing in, in, the, in the political discourse, what politicians talk about, uh, what people talk about in social media, right? And that, um, uh, that's very much a securitized discourse, which is also um, taken uh, by the media. And that's also um, how um, we can argue that crisis framing contributes to that uh, discourse. And when it comes to uh, how do I place that all uh, and why do I actually approach um, my thesis uh, from a cosmopolitan perspective? And I um, will explain that a little bit. Um, so uh, basically what I check is whether BBC World News uh, covered the news from a more national outlook or cosmopolitan outlook, um, whether they perceive uh, audiences as cosmopolitan audiences or national audiences. And all of that actually comes from uh, my readings from uh, Beck, uh, so Ulrich Beck, uh, a German sociologist. Um, 
Uh, so he has extensive um, research on this and um, what uh, he proposes basically, and it's actually, um, at first it's challenging to understand the, 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 the points made by Beck, but uh, very simply put, um, cosmopolitanism is not international. It does not mean that it's, it's, a, it's a blend of uh, national, international, transnational, local, global, all at the same time. And uh, what is interesting in Beck's approach uh, is that cosmopolitanism is not um, something that is purely normative um, or some, simply something that, uh, as Immanuel Kant, for instance, um, uh, idealized. Um, and uh, so he's not at that um, level of uh, making cosmopolitanism as something to reach, something that is very normative, but he says, Cosmopolitanism is the reality of our times because we uh, share the risks um, that we're surrounded with. And it's inevitable that we look at the world from this perspective, because if something happens in Turkey, somebody in North Carolina actually might be affected by, by this. So um, we know all of these uh, sort of crises, right? Climate crisis, refugee crisis, um, uh, many actually uh, developments that are happening that makes our worlds uh, actually interconnected. So it's uh, not just um, uh, the way that we can actually do uh, right uh, via Zoom, we are interconnected, but um, even there are other stuff that makes us even more connected and we're not maybe aware of that, but it is the reality of our times. Um, and what Beck suggests uh, is that, um, also from a research point of view, um, so methodological nationalism, uh, so their research that only focuses on, you know, uh, and it's very popular actually, uh, focusing on one country, on comparing two countries, and he's against that. Um, and also he makes a call uh, to, to researchers to have that kind of um, uh, a more cosmopolitan outlook rather than uh, a national uh, one. So it's also against this kind of methodological nationalism. Uh, for me, it is important to, to use this uh, theoretical construct because um, I also noticed in BBC's um, texts, right, in editorial guidelines and all of that uh, that is shared. Um, it was quite interesting to see how they constantly to switch between international, global, uh, sometimes uh, local, right, when it's uh, that. And BBC is a huge organization, uh, but for BBC World News specifically, they are interested in an audience that they are also not that much aware of, actually. So that's also something that we discuss in interviews. Um, uh, audience metrics are actually not that helpful when it comes to that, and maybe that's my assumption, but um, it also reads uh, like this, uh, when when talk to journalists, um, they have difficulty in understanding that audience and trying to imagine that audience. Um, so my uh, standing point here is very close to Beck's, um, meaning it is both pragmatic, uh, saying that it is uh, the reality and this is what it is, but also, um, and more normative. So there is also this slide um, towards the end, I will ask those questions. Um, that's uh, maybe journalism, uh, when it comes to international news media, is expected to practice a, 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 a cosmopolitan journalism. So that's also my um, normative call, if you will, um, in, in my research. So the aim of my research is to show how the BBC World News approach news from a more lo local outlook um, rather than a global or cosmopolitan outlook. So that's also, um, that was my starting point, my hunch, uh, which was confirmed basically as some of my findings and how risks are framed accordingly. Uh, while doing this, I use migration, a highly sensitive and politicized issue to inform my case study and check how the uh, Syrian uh, refugee crisis is framed. To investigate how the BBC journalists um, reflect uh, on their own work and practice. So these are all basically connected to the research questions that I shared um, just a while ago. And why TV news packages? So here uh, you could see many um, different uh, visuals. So some of the screenshots that I used in my um, analysis from these uh, packages. Um, 
there are lots to say here, actually. I mean, personally, of course, I'm interested in TV news packages as I was a journalist, but uh, and putting packages together myself, I was always questioning uh, my conscience, whether am I telling the whole story in these packages? But as a researcher, my interest uh, obviously grew um, in trying to understand um, how they select news, how they curate news. And um, was it um, only me, for instance, right, questioning, but how do an international news channel, because I used to work at a, um, not a, a part of international channel CNN Turk, but it was not CNN International, for instance, but how would my um, colleagues, uh, journalists, uh, would then uh, reflect on, on this? Uh, so that was my starting point. And, TV news packages are really um, powerful. Um, so they combine audio and visual, which is also challenging for researchers to, 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 to actually research this. Um, it's not as easy as text or just visuals. Audiovisual uh, analysis requires also a lot of decisions and, um, uh, and making it also relatively easy for the researcher and making it consistently uh, same coding, applying it uh, to, to, to throughout all the all the packages. But the, when you look at these images, I'm pretty sure uh, these are all um, uh, familiar to you. So there is one reporter who is uh, from a distance reporting on uh, the, the refugees uh, in, in a boat um, and saying basically there, I think his lines were something around um, yeah, they are coming and uh, Europe can basically not stop this or something like that. And that was also that's one of the strong, um, actually, uh, announcements that I heard in, in a TV news package. Um, we see a lot of maps in, um, not a lot, but occasionally, actually, uh, in my sample at least, I saw these kind of uh, maps where you see, right, so uh, you probably see these little dots here. Um, these are the... Um, the way um, refugees actually take the route uh, that they take. Um, and uh, as you can see, uh, three countries are um, the top destinations. Uh, so this is basically framed as such. So nobody wants to stay in Greece, in Italy, uh, in Spain, but they all want to go to Northwestern and more affluent West. Um, and UK is even, uh, if you, look at the color, it's even more emphasized here um, because that's BBC. Um, here, uh, well, the sun is actually, uh, and also the uh, lot of visuals of kids, these are uh, arguably uh, cinematographic elements. Um, these are staples in news packages. So the sun rising, for instance, is something that I always investigated also, always questioned myself as well when I was in, uh, in, in the business. Um, so why are we using these, right? So these are actually um, what makes um, a, a very dramatic story, uh, perhaps a beautiful looking story. And these are actually not that crucial uh, to the package, and, but they are used a lot. Uh, the, um, uh, the, the, the kids in the news, again, uh, in refugee camps uh, with their uh, parents traveling on refugee trails. Um, again, the storyline does not say anything about the kids most often, um, but they are used a lot, uh, their visuals, because it's, uh, it attracts people's uh, attention um, and they are uh, used a lot in, in these uh, refugee crisis stories. Uh, they're always at the checkpoints, uh, the border, the fences, they are used a lot in TV news packages. And this is basically um, shows uh, the, the value of, of my question, I think, uh, how also they create that framing around refugees so that um, we no longer think of uh, refugees as um, as humans maybe, but they are there at a distance um, and they suffer. Uh, and that's basically what as an audience uh, and then as a researcher, what I felt uh, that, um, that maybe these are, uh, maybe this is wrong. Maybe uh, a slightly different uh, approach might actually help, uh, not just to reach to a cosmopolitan audience, but again, this is very much connected to cosmopolitanism because um, yeah, humans are human, right? And they are not um, uh, 
they cannot be considered as the distant other uh, because that person uh, is also uh, a part of your society and potentially is uh, coming to, to, to that society. And therefore, um, in my view, the, that's the very more normative part of the, of the thesis is that uh, the, 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 the news can be uh, on refugees can be more uh, human. And why did I choose BBC World News? Uh, well, it is part of uh, the BBC, Europe's largest public broadcaster, um, which means they have a lot of audiences and I don't share the exact numbers here. They're changing year by year, but um, they are uh, pretty popular. And it belongs to BBC's commercial activities. Um, however, they still follow the BBC's editorial guidelines. And that's basically what I discussed earlier. Uh, even though they uh, aim for a cosmopolitan or as in their words maybe international or global audiences it's difficult to um also conceive them for them uh, to, to which exact audience um they um uh bbc world news still follows basically these guidelines uh, of um prepared all for the whole bbc which means um, that uh, they need to follow um, the, the, all these public missions uh, to inform, educate, etc. And this is mainly for national audience, actually. Uh, so we don't have one uh, big public broadcaster for the whole world, right? So these are mainly for uh, nation states. And that's the, the kind of logic that operates. And I don't criticize that, but this is the way that, um, uh, that they, they operate and that has value, definitely. But once they also go out of their um, uh, much smaller audience, but they aim um, in, in English language, um, and there are examples of that other than BBC, of course, um, then they aim for, um, for larger audiences. And that responsibility, uh, in my uh, argument, should be different uh, than uh, what they owe to, to the nation, right? So while the BBC World News is committed to the public missions of the BBC, it targets a cosmopolitan audience, looks at foreign news from a British European perspective. Um, and that's clearly visible actually in their discourse. Um, in, in, and if any of you is interested, I can share a few links later on. It's always a bit problematic to play videos in, in, a, um, in a Zoom meeting, but uh, the discourse used uh, in, in the news packages are uh, mainly uh, things like they're coming here to our shores, to our beaches, uh, or making um, things come closer home. For instance, reporting from um, Keletis Station in, in Budapest and saying, uh, well, this could be Piccadilly, look around. Um, and this is all um, with, filled with refugees. And uh, so this basically makes uh, news uh, come closer home, uh, domesticating the news and how it's relevant, uh, how it may be relevant in the near future to, uh, to a British audience, for instance. So all of these are um, uh, for also for casual observation, it can be, uh, uh, it's possible to, to, to see that. What I did was to, to make it more systematic, obviously, with content analysis. Like in other uh, international news channels, the Syrian refugee crisis has become a staple of news agenda. And that was actually um, uh, quite easy to check when I started collecting my data. I saw that I can find uh, quite a lot of these. And how many of these? I actually collected 240 news packages uh, of in on average two and a half minutes. Uh, that's basically the main rhythm of traditional news packages. So I avoided actually collecting digital news packages because they have different dynamics. And I had to then create another code book for that. So uh, to make things also more manageable um, in, in this research, I did collect only 240 traditional news packages. And then I interviewed 14 uh, BBC journalists. So I conducted semi-structured uh, interviews. And um, uh, so that lasted. Uh, at least an hour, one and a half hour, and they shared quite valuable uh, information and about their uh, own work. Um, so here, um, maybe I can skip these parts later and explain a bit more, um, but let me check um, where I am in, in my slides quickly. Yes. Um, I'll 
skip these a little bit fast, I think. Um, maybe they are too specific as a method for you, for your studies, but I think mixed methods content analysis is actually used a lot in, um, and also political science and sociology and psychology, uh, and in my field in media and communications. Uh, what I did is um, rather than doing just quantitative or qualitative, I approached uh, this from a mixed uh, methods approach, um, uh, meaning uh, that I did do some parts quantitatively uh, using my code book and very strictly coding them, assigning categories and values to my variables. And then I use spaces for, for these. And I will share some um, results uh, from that analysis. Um, but mainly, my method is actually qualitative, meaning I actually looked at all these 240 news packages also closely um, and tried to reveal uh, the themes uh, that are arising from them. And that was the kind of things that I was not able to either operationalize in, in the code book or things that I simply um, did not uh, notice when I was um, deductively uh, preparing my, uh, my code book, so at the beginning of the research. Uh, so it's a little bit technical perhaps, but uh, I think it's useful also for, uh, for, for social sciences. It's a, it's a method that I would recommend. It's actually, um, it's very objective and I, uh, I greatly enjoyed doing that. And I also actually teach this method in, in Erasmus. Um, and when it comes to uh, semi-structured interviews, uh, the interview procedure actually differed a little bit for me. I did interview many of these um, uh, interviewees in London. Uh, so I was actually a, uh, I did my research visit in Cardiff in 2018. So that was the time I collected my data. Uh, a few of interviewees, I met them in Cardiff because they were working for the BBC Wales. Uh, mainly, but also their reports go to BBC World News. Um, and some uh, I, I talked via Skype or uh, via phone, uh, but all together uh, I did manage to interview some of the most famous um, correspondents of the, of the BBC. Uh, so the main teams, and these are really the rough teams, uh, there were many actually uh, that arise from the interviews, but um, broadly what we spoke about was TV journalism practices, um, and uh, they all complained about limited time, which has great uh, implications actually on framing, because if um, if they can tell uh, the whole story, um, well, they can tell the whole story, but they can't because it's not a documentary. It's just a two minute uh, news video package. The most they can get is maybe four or five minutes if it's a very special uh, piece or if that news is placed on a higher rank in the news agenda uh, than compared to other news. Um, the visuals, without visuals, you cannot get uh, you cannot report, you cannot prepare a TV news package, and that was also one of the main limitations that they discussed um, quite often. And that has, again, um, that's also connected and very interesting in case of Syria, because, um, uh, well, they cannot, um, it's not very easy to get in, uh, it's dangerous, um, and uh, and different ways and tactics that they applied trying to get in. Uh, and it's basically, uh, what I understood from the interviews uh, that BBC basically did not prefer to endanger their own staff, but they relied on freelancers. So that was also quite interesting, trying to understand how news gathering actually take, take place. Um, foreign news and reporting uh, distance suffering uh, was also uh, the themes that I wanted to discuss and they answered uh, those questions. Uh, what is foreign news and how they actually go and cover these places? Is it because that they live close by Syria? Of course not. Um, they fly in, uh, stay a couple of days, and that's what's called in the literature as parachute journalism. And some of my interviewees actually knew that term and they knew that they were actually parachuting to the country just for a few days, almost like a tourist, um, and, uh, and try to understand very quickly what's going on on the ground and then come back. Um, and already have packaged the news and, and come back just after a few days. So it's very difficult for also for these individual journalists to grasp what's going on in there and contextualize it and frame it accordingly. Uh, so that also has a lot of uh, implications in when it comes to the framing the news. Uh, imagining the audiences was another uh, main theme that I discussed uh, with interviewees and uh, for them, 
uh, that was basically, I wasn't expecting that actually, that they would say that 10 o'clock news, which is BBC One and its national audience, they say, uh, quite a few of them said, uh, that's my main market. And that's what makes them uh, also famous uh, in, in an audience that they can uh, better imagine, uh, meaning that they can actually uh, understand, right? Um, the, the tendencies, what they need to know, etc. cetera. Uh, whereas it is quite difficult to, to, to cater to the audience, it's, uh, it's very difficult to imagine, uh, which in this case is a cosmopolitan uh, audience, which uh, presumably uh, BBC World News actually uh, wants to uh, reach. And I did, um, and this, this technical part I used at last CI for uh, analyzing the interviews and I applied thematic analysis for that. And when it comes to a bit more on the theoretical background, uh, and I'm pretty sure uh, you are already thinking about your own master thesis and um, how to bring all that together. Um, so maybe for some of you, it might be interested if you're interested in, uh, yeah, it's very disciplinary, interdisciplinary European studies as well. And I, as a graduate myself, um, I'm so interested in how uh, media and communication is actually uh, also a field as such. So the onion model tells us a lot uh, about, about society, not just about journalism, actually. Um, so here, um, that's a proposition uh, made by um, Weichenberg in 1994 and renewed with uh, Schumacher and Rees's uh, article. Um, so um, that visual tells us basically that um, these are all layers and they affect each other. And individual journals are not the sole responsible of their news, but news routines uh, are part of it. Organizations, in this case, BBC, for instance, what I look at, they are bound by organizations' rules. Uh, they are bound by social institutions, all these regulatory uh, frameworks, uh, right, a country might have, uh, and social systems. And this um, can be obviously, um, taught in terms of one country, but that can also be, of course, applicable uh, in the case of a, a news channel that is uh, international, that operates um, uh, from uh, many countries, for instance, that can obviously apply to a much larger uh, context. So it does not have to be um, a national in, in perspective. So what I, uh, and how I use this is actually very much connected to news values um, and how, uh, first of all, um, uh, the news, uh, the, an item, right, uh, becomes news. Um, so that uh, takes us to um, gatekeeping, agenda setting, and uh, again, which is then connected to news framing. So gatekeeping, um, again, is a term that not only, not it did not start, uh, the word gatekeeper, I think, was first used in 1940s, and Kurt Levin, I think, uh, was the, the first, um, um, want to use this and it's not just uh, about media and communication basically right so gatekeeping um uh, became a very popular in media and communication studies later on uh and it is about filtering editorial filtering of what is uh to be uh covered but it's the really the first uh part where the edit editor has that gatekeeper role. Um, and then agenda setting goes a little beyond that. Agenda setting is when there are multiple news and um, that are selected. And some says that it's also about how it, they are curated, but it's mainly about uh, how um, you make that selection of news to present the audiences. And that's basically what audiences consume is uh, determined by determined by that agenda setting uh, procedure. So that's uh, uh, and actually that's a good fact I think to know. McCombs and Shaw, who are uh, well, the fathers of that theory, um, are researchers uh, from UNC Chapel Hill, and they did a, a very influential study back in uh, 1970s. And they uh, actually they took the election of 1968, I believe. Um, and that's how they tested. So they checked the news agenda, they checked what people think about it, and they saw that news media actually are pretty much influential in what people think about. But it's not about what pe how people think about, and how people think about part has to do with more 
uh, news framing and that theory. So it goes beyond agenda setting and some actually call that as second level agenda setting. Um, these are all very interesting theories for me and very important for my research and for any journalism studies uh, research, I believe. Um, so gatekeeping is connected to agenda setting and it sets a process uh, like a red thread actually, and then connects to news framing. And uh, any journalists actually are uh, involved in this without even being perhaps even uh, thinking about it on a daily basis, but that's basically what they uh, actually do. And Harkop on, on an, and O'Neill um, has uh, some uh, very interesting news values, which comes from 1960s, Galton and uh, Ruge's um, uh, article, actually. Uh, and they develop these news values. Uh, they look at news and, OK, um, they, they check uh, what is covered. And there are some uh, 10 uh, or 12 uh, news values that they found uh, that's uh, covered most often. So why? A, a, a news item has a value because it has a celebrity, it has a power figure, uh, a negative news, a good news, um, a proximity, which is very important for my uh, research because um, the BBC only started to, to cover the issue only when it became closer uh, geographically. And that's something that also uh, journalists uh, told me about that, um, and that was a self critique basically of the of their own coverage, um, that uh, proximity matters. And uh, if uh, it is closer to London, basically, then uh, news value increases in that case. We already discussed what is cosmopolitanism. Uh, I don't get into that anymore. But uh, the way that basically risks are framed, so connecting also to risk society, um, the, the way that uh, the risks are framed, um, uh, you also, as a journalist, um, prepare the news according to the target audience and the risks uh, are framed accordingly, according to that target audience. Um, and that reveals basically the way that journalists frame risks reveal for what audience um, they actually uh, prepare that news for. Um, so that's actually quite interesting, uh, in my opinion. Uh, risk society and uh, cultural fear, I did benefit a lot from Beck, uh, but also Freddie and other scholars who, who published a lot on uh, cultural fear. And this is actually quite uh, interesting how um, anxieties are fueled, how um, do we fear, right? Is it coming from, actually it has a lot of psychological uh, underpinnings. Uh, is it um, because we live it or because we see it? And um, in our very mediatized world, actually, um, we can uh, confidently say that a lot of our fears actually come from what we see in the media. And that's why it is very important to uh, research how risks and crises are, are framed in the news. So do news have a uh, cosmopolitan audience or national? Uh, you know, when you watch BBC World News from Chapel Hill, uh, does it actually um, tell you uh, or do you feel connected when you watch news? So these are all, uh, I think, uh, interesting to, or is it because we watch BBC birth news just to see a British perspective, right? Uh, maybe that's the case and um, maybe um, the normative assumption um, or role that uh, I assign as a researcher maybe is not uh, taking in practice. Um, how do risks mediated through cultural fear, national and cultural frames? Um, again, you know, these are what, what is used basically most often when risks are framed because it's much easier to, uh, to, to basically operationalize uh, what is uh, a risk. And Beck basically um, says uh, in his more, um, uh, this is more of a call, uh, but also a reality. Uh, so what uh, he says, these are imagined cosmopolitan communities of uh, global risks. Um, so that's uh, an imagined community, but it is cosmopolitan um, and the risks are global and they are all uh, shared. I will talk about this uh, in, in, in a moment. Um, so I add on top of Beck and propose something um, rather uh, slightly different. I see something in the chat. Um, Yes, should I come to questions later or? Um... Oh, okay. I, I think I can come to that uh, in the end. That will be, I think, more fitting. But thank you for the question. 
Uh, so talking about the uh, uh, crisis a bit more, um, we can definitely do that and I will open the floor to you. Uh, you are also very much interested in the area I know, um, so maybe we can have a nice um, conversation on, on this. Uh, some descriptive analysis, and I don't want to bore you too much with that, um, because I think we're also, we also are running out of time and I want to discuss uh, with you. So the videos were uh, this uh, much, two and a half minutes. What was interesting was correspondents are mostly white and male. Um, and these are the main topics in the videos, humanitarian crisis, national politics, etc. cetera. Um, and the majority of the interviewees were refugees, which is not uh, surprising. Um, and the majority of the news packages included at least one interviewee. Uh, sources were varied among these uh, sources and locations were interesting for my analysis because of because I do look at uh, visuals a lot. So host country, refugee camp, um, borders, fences, they were used a lot in, in all these uh, packages and they were quite interesting. Here, what is interesting in this graph, um, so I did use um, Antman, a framing scholar uh, whose paper was very influential. So he says, in a news journalist, define problem, describe the problem. And the way that they describe the problem, um, the way that I constructed these categories, um, looking at the data that I have in hand, uh, it was defined as the, the, the main problem of this refugee crisis was defined as war at the very beginning, right? And it's actually still is uh, the, the main problem, but it only, um, it, it starts to be coupled with something else here. And that's, I think very interesting, trying to reach Europe. So in some news packages, um, and these packages are sometimes just a snapshot of reality. And that's also a criticism for this kind of format. And journalists are also very much aware of that. So trying to reach Europe, uh, starts to become uh, the main problem of, of these packages in the, in the journalist discourse. That was quite uh, interesting and striking for me uh, to see. Uh, so trying to reach Europe basically uh, causes the um, accidents right in the Mediterranean. They, they drown and uh, other misfortunes happen on the way and so on. And that's all because trying to reach Europe. Um, so that was, that's, there are much more to discuss here, but I want to um, go a little quicker. Uh, so how are refugees framed? Um, they're framed uh, both at the same time human, but also as victims. And uh, they're also desperate. They face with mortal danger, um, not too little amount, actually, almost 20% of the time. Um, so that makes uh, basically uh, almost 50 packages out of 240. Um, refugees were framed as faceless masses. And how uh, do I define that? Um, it could be a graphic, for instance, in the background with people, uh, just uh, trying to uh, select only one story, but again, turning to numbers, for instance. And that was actually quite, um, a, a difficult uh, decision also in the coding process, but faceless message was, uh, uh, it cannot be undermined. Uh, and it was, um, it was observable uh, in the way that I operationalized that. Um, and threats uh, and illegal migrants and the way that it was, they were framed as threats, simply saying illegal migrants um, framed them as threat actually to, to society potentially, and that was uh, in 10% of the packages. Um, the discourse used by journalists, um, again, I mentioned these earlier, this is the part where the, the reporter says, this is our beaches, these are our train stations, etc. And here, uh, the reporter basically resembles Skeleti station in Hungary to Piccadilly, and um, not resembling, but uh, trying to uh, make audience understand what might happen in Piccadilly if refugees reach to the UK. So the visuals used in news packages uh, sometimes are very much um, connected to that process while the refugees flee at that very moment. And that's also very much uh, connected to TV journalism mindsets. So, uh, and also these people are in a terribly vulnerable situation. Uh, they are filmed um, and they are most often shown as weak uh, and weak people uh, behind uh, the, the camera lenses. Uh, 
So very briefly, my main results um, that I, the, the way that I could summarize basically, uh, so BBC World News has framed the Syrian refugee crisis as passive victims of the crisis. Uh, they don't have agency most often an active voice in the news stories so giving them voice in the interviews um, do not always equate uh, with giving them an active voice so that was also uh, some uh, time i took to to reflect on this and i wrote about those bbc world news has reported on the syrian refugee crisis from a british and european perspective rather than cosmopolitan uh, for a majority of interviewees, the primary audience seems to be the domestic audience, um, as the 10 o'clock news is, uh, in their own work, their main uh, market, uh, and that was actually quite uh, striking for me. What I do contribute to the literature, uh, my humble contribution is actually advancing uh, what, what Beck has said already, so imagined cosmopolitan um, communities of global risks is his suggestion. Um, and according to my uh, results, uh, looking at the BBC World News case and the Syrian refugee crisis coverage, what I do see is uh, more of uh, imagined communities of global risks. And global in this case is the risks as perceived by Europe, by Britain, and imagined communities is simply a community that is difficult to define and therefore um, I did not add the word cosmopolitan next to it, but simply uh, the way that it is seen, the BBC World News audiences by that organization basically uh, could be claimed as imagined communities of global uh, or of, of local risks. So according to this, risks are seen as both from a mix of global and local perspective. So some global tendencies we see there which tends to be more regional and national uh, rather than cosmopolitan. Um, and I think for you, especially um, you are based in, in the United States, you could even see these um, differences or uh, nuances uh, probably even clearer than I can from Turkey or from the Netherlands where I live. Um, that's, that's really a mix and this, uh, the audiences really speak to, uh, the news really speak to a, a, a European uh, audience. Um, and, uh, and which is uh, odd, right? Because BBC World News actually uh, can be consumed via online uh, because the website is also something that belongs to BBC Global, which is uh, commercial uh, and, uh, and it is reachable uh, from, the, from the States. Um, and you would probably see also, if you look at the news that uh, you see a bit more uh, European or British uh, perspective. So the imagined community as TV audiences is therefore not cosmopolitan, but British or European. Again, continued with my main results and I'm approaching to the, towards the end. So most of the interviewees were critical of the BBC's uh, global approach. So that was actually um, something that they reflected themselves as well. So the coverage only intensified only when refugees started to move towards Europe. So, Actually, around 2011, uh, refugees were crossing the border towards Turkey, for instance. That was not uh, much of a news, at least um, from uh, what we could see, right? Um, also in my pack, um, in my um, in my data, also that's not that uh, frequently covered. Um, and they also acknowledge the journalists also acknowledge um, that. Content analysis reveals that this um, global approach, uh, well, the, this global approach, especially in the in the qualitative part of my study, and while journalism is becoming, and I didn't talk much about that part actually, um, because journalism is not static. Journalism is not something that uh, is um, there, and um, it is transforming every day. Journalism uh, is not exempt from these uh, digital transformations and journalists themselves are pretty much aware of that. They do feel under pressure of um, making more creative um, news packages that would attract the audience's attention, which also puts, um, well, which also gives us some clues about how attention economy is um, becoming more and more dominant because bbc.com also right now is, um, is uh, competing with Google even as a website, right? So this is, um, these are all interesting and uh, emphasized even in their uh, in BBC's uh, website when they share uh, how much they have clicks per year, per week, etc. 
Um, all of these comparisons include um, not just CNN, for instance, their competitor, but also all these platforms, Facebook, Twitter, Google, and so on. So journalism has to become, in a sense, um, and journalists feel under tremendous pressure, pressure basically to be able to cater to what has to come and what is going on. So journalists have shared the constraints also of TV journalism and foreign correspondence. Uh, their accounts revealed that uh, the TV news package as a format is um, is valuable. So the, from my research perspective, basically, um, it shows that um, uh, the visual framing was the right approach to, to analyze uh, these uh, video packages. Is cosmopolitan journalism possible? So that's a more normative uh, and more ethical question, perhaps, uh, that I would like to ask to um, international uh, news outlets and also to any journalists, basically, who might be at some point working for an international uh, or cosmopolitan um, uh, audience. Um, so is it actually possible? I don't have an answer for this, um, but it is a question that um, attracts many, um, actually not too many, but it has uh, attracted a lot of attention in journalism studies among, among scholars who are interested in these questions um, on media ethics, on uh, journalistic practices. Um, and it's an open-ended question and uh, it has yet to see basically whether we actually uh, can argue or whether um, we can um, ask this from international news outlets even. So the limitations of my study include actually several things, but I do have a relatively small sample. I did only look at one case analysis, so I did not have a comparative case uh, in this study. Interviewees were only correspondents, while actually cameramen, um, editors, and they are all uh, involved in news framing practices, as I've shown earlier in the news uh, framing in the in the newsroom, right? Uh, but uh, for me, practically, it was difficult to, to reach cameramen um, and uh, and editors because um, uh, only the names of correspondents are shared in these news. And uh, for me, it was much easier to somehow reach them by a Twitter, and I got a lot of help, of course, from Cardiff University as well. Uh, but my uh, that's one, one limitation, basically. I, I do value um, the, the contributions of all um, all the team, basically, in, and I do believe that they are equally responsible in the framing of the news. Uh, not having researched uh, news framing effects, that's a limitation, but it's also not within the scope of my study. So in one study, it's very difficult to look at the message at the same time and the effects parts, uh, so that had to be excluded, although it is pretty much important in uh, among framing scholars, and they do suggest uh, we should actually focus more on news framing uh, effects. Uh, and future research uh, informed by these uh, limitations, what they can do. Um, uh, what I did find very difficult was the, the coding of the audiovisual content. And it will be, of course, uh, much uh, easier for a single um, researcher to, to work with larger data if you can only do automated content analysis or computer-aided systems. Um, but it's very difficult to, to, to do that for visual audiovisual analysis. So there are some for visual analysis, although limited, but for audiovisual, audio it's pretty difficult to, to automatize that process. Um, sample uh, can be increased, of course, and comparative approaches can be adopted. Uh, codebook uh, that, that, that I designed for this research can definitely be um, used for, uh, for in other studies or tailored to own needs uh, of the study. And yeah, as I said, you know, if I did do another research, probably this time I will try to understand actually how um, this has an effect on the on the audience. But this is practically difficult if um, the website does have comments uh, section closed online. Uh, so I would rather otherwise I would do an ethnography. Um, but uh, there is also a tendency, basically, in news media that they want to get their audiences back uh, from social media and uh, include audiences a bit more. And that's only, um, yeah, journalism, as I said, is becoming, right? And that's, um, that's only how they can remain relevant. And if they aim to actually practice cosmopolitan journalism, they need to understand their audiences better. And you cannot do this only by clicks, audience metrics, very quantitative data. 
uh, to be able to understand audiences, a qualitative approach in this sense and really using audience comments, making audiences engage and contribute. Um, in that case, then uh, it will be much easier for journalists to understand um, uh, the impact of their uh, of their content on the on the audiences, get all the suggestions and everything. And for researchers, it will be of course much easier to to also do uh, participant observation and ethnography. So uh, the digital version of ethnography, uh, that then it will be much more um, of course easy easier to 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 analyze these. And now I think it's, I would like to open the floor finally, and sorry that it took a bit long. Um, hopefully uh, that was uh, interesting for you. Um, now I'm ready for um, questions. Maybe I should start with the one in the chat. Um, yes. Would you comment on the origins of, so Mel asks, would you comment on the origins of the Syrian refugee crisis? I visited Syria in 2018 and heard their point of view that the Western media misrepresents the war. The West calls it a civil war. Syrians generally understand the last 10 years as war of aggression funded in part by the West. Um, yes, um, thank you, Mel, uh, from Common Humanities in New York. Um, is Mel with us? Uh, oh, hello. Yes, thank hi. you so much you. for this question. And it's great that you've been to Syria, you probably, no more than I do. I've never been to Syria, to be honest. Um, so we could actually uh, benefit from your insights and um, uh, uh, first, if you if you will, and maybe I can contribute on that. Uh, thank you so much for your comments. Um, I've been to Syria about four or five times over the past fifteen years. Most recently, I was there just about exactly three years ago. I visited Aleppo, war-torn Aleppo, and Damascus. The basic simple point of view I would raise here is with respect, with all due respect to the BBC, the people of Syria, as I understood the people for my visit, don't agree with the point of view of the BBC in terms of the origins. That is not, there was trouble at the beginning, but the what it morphed in, it, it morphed into a war of aggression by the West. So the US and UK and others are funding these crazy terrorists actually um, who are attacking Syria and the people of Syria said look after 10 years the government of Syria imperfect though it may be is still standing uh, so I wonder if you have any comment about the origins of this uh, and that that's basically my point of view as a matter of fact so yeah, it's a very valid point. I mean, the, the origins of the crisis is basically from uh, in my research, obviously I look at the output, right? So how it is covered, how the journalists view uh, what's going on. And uh, of course, as I, as I also said in my presentation, it's um, uh, journalists uh, most often actually parachute to the, to the country without actually having the understanding of what is actually going on in the ground. And many journalists actually told me and these are the more uh, well, younger or less experienced in the Middle East, uh, uh, relatively younger journalists told me that it took them quite a while to, to, to really get into, uh, and it's very complex, right? So there's ISIS, there's other um, uh, groups, uh, how they're connected and so on. Uh, as journalists themselves, they are also in the first few days they're lost and they try to understand what's going on on the ground. They have limited knowledge about the country. They have limited understanding or time to even talk to uh, locals and uh, politicians or even understand if there are two sides of the story or multiple sides of the story to really get to that understanding, to really digest what's going on in there. And that's one of the limitations of not just TV journalism or not just the BBC, it is a tendency uh, from uh, the readings that I do, also the memoirs of foreign correspondents, what I can see is that um, they're left kind of um, uh, alone in the field in that respect. And they are not given enough time uh, to, to cover all of the journalists want a bit more time to really understand uh, and being able to reflect the truth and understand the truth first themselves to be able to report that truth. So that's why it's, uh, I think, very important to, to study visual uh, visuals and visual framing because that's the only material that TV can have and building on that, they make news. So uh, 
crying children are news because it's negative um, or yeah, bombing or things like that, they, they make news. Um, but most often, and that's also why I looked at how journalists um, described the problem, it's important because if they lose sight of it, if they lose the, the very understanding, and that's the most basic understanding of the crisis, the refugee crisis is war, uh, or uh, in other words, however the locals describe what's going on or the conflict or, um, uh, or whatever that is going on in Syria, uh, they, or the reason why people flee from Syria is becoming less and less important in the news, especially from 2015 onwards, because these people are moving towards Europe it becomes quote unquote European problem rather than what's going on in Syria. And they, uh, the story and the very origins of the crisis uh, is no longer observable in the, in the news. Uh, so that was at least my, uh, my observation. Thank you very much for, for the question. Um, Michael has a question, I think. Um, would you like to ask Michael or should I? Um, Sure, I, I can ask. Um, I think you noticed a large uptick in 2015 that the framing changed from more of the general war to more security um, yeah. in the UK. So I was wondering if, if you ever determined, or maybe it wasn't in the scope of your research, if that reframing was a response, I think, to the election campaign that the UK <laughs> was having in 2015. And during the last couple of days of uh, the, the Brexit referendum, there was a similar framing of immigration along the lines of security, but that was more of a response to stuff that Nigel Farage or other conservative politicians were saying at the time. So I'm just wondering if you notice any correlation between campaigns and reframing. Yeah, I think for that, I would have to have a second researcher with me to also yeah, uh, give me some insight on that. Um, and also perhaps another data set to, to cross check uh, these tendencies, right? Uh, for me, um, it was uh, basically looking at, it's very important, I think, looking at the same time what's going on in the country, right? Uh, that could be Brexit, that could be elections that is upcoming, uh, and so on. So maybe the reason why the packages sometimes peaked uh, could be for that reason, or maybe some when they, they become less in the coverage, could be because of the national um, uh, domestic uh, priorities that uh, that are the case at that day, at that week, uh, at that month even. But to be able to actually make a solid judgment on this, I would probably need to have all the news agenda of that day from BBC, uh, which will be uh, in practice pretty difficult to, to gather um, as, a, as, a, as a single researcher who didn't have access actually to BBC's archive. But uh, that's a very good uh, point. And I I think it's um, especially I think a research who did look, for instance, a two weeks time frame uh, around or uh, a couple of time frames selected around the uh, important uh, times when um, uh, important things are happening domestically in Britain and how uh, at that time uh, versus a regular uh, law politics uh, domestic uh, agenda times, how foreign news are uh, treated. A comparative analysis like that actually uh, would be very interesting. And at the beginning of my research, I, I thought about that. Should I compare domestic news agenda to foreign news agenda? But it was very difficult to, to handle this without having full access to archives and doing even participant observation. But uh, yeah, that would be very interesting research. And I would like to definitely um, uh, read if anyone, if, if anybody actually does that. Uh, but yeah, it's a very good. Um, it's a very good uh, point. Yeah. Thank you, Michael. Is that an answer? <laughs> um, I have a question. I was wondering how you selected the packages you studied. Were those ones that had maybe the most interest or attention on social media, or were those the ones that you were yourself most interested in? Yeah, I did have some keywords, search keywords, basically, um, that I, I collected them directly via websites. Um, and for me, it was important uh, just to make it strict. Uh, my, my sampling strategy needed to be strict in that uh, respect. So I selected 10 keywords uh, that are connected to the crisis. So they use a lot migration crisis, for instance. They, you don't always have Syria in the title, but migration crisis, 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 
uh, refugee crisis and so on. So uh, this list expands. Uh, I had 10 uh, keywords as such, and I collected them uh, via um, the BBC's website. So that was my main source. Hi, I have a question. Um, I, my question is, I know that you had a limited scope of research and that um, you focused mostly on visuals, but I'm wondering if you had any comparatives with print media sources um, mm -hmm. and the rhetoric that might have been similar or comparable between the two. Mm -hmm. uh, no, I didn't. Uh, as I said, yeah, the sample was actually pretty limited uh, because news, uh, uh, audiovisual content analysis take a lot of time. And, um, and these are basically need to be considered as two separate data sets uh, and cross comparison between articles and video packages would be another, uh, I, I guess, uh, research uh, approach. Uh, in my case, I did want to focus only on one and just to make it actually my life easier, I could have focused just on articles and many research does actually, uh, and I could have collected uh, more articles and even uh, opt for automated content analysis to actually increase the sample and make it actually more generalizable with my results. Uh, that would have been an option, but looking at um, uh, all of the BBC's contents uh, would probably, yeah, I would um, have to make another code book for, for that because the unit of analysis is different, uh, but it would have been possible, of course. And um, yeah, I did not look at the, at the, at the uh, articles uh, and visuals in those articles. It looks like Hope has a question too. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, I do. I do. So Hello. thank you for speaking with us. Hi, I'm a TAM student. Um, thank you. Uh, your research is so interesting. I think so relevant um, nowadays. Um, I have a question. You, you mentioned uh, social media towards the end. And right now, you know, there's a lot of pressure towards social media companies and uh, even in America, you know, it's gone uh, before Congress. Um, and I'm wondering how with, how do I frame this? Like in um, some populations, people are using social media as their main source of news. Um, I'm wondering how has the like pr growth and proliferation of social media as news news outlets how that has um, influenced how more um, normative social media like the BBC uh, or no normative news sites like the BBC and others how that has changed how they kind of how the agenda set or how they uh, how it influenced how they frame certain mm -hmm. arguments um, or perhaps it doesn't influence them as much as I think it does. Um, could you speak on that a little bit? Of course. Yeah, of course. Um, it was not particularly my research interest, but I, the interviews actually revealed some points regarding that. It's, une uh, they, it's inevitable um, that they, uh, they cannot ignore, the BBC cannot ignore the, the, the developments, uh, what's going on in social media citizen journalism rights. Um, so there are uh, all, everybody who uh, reports on what's going on, uh, upload something on social media, right? And they are, they are all in that respect, if we use social media a lot and uh, share uh, visuals and opinions, etc., cetera, uh, that's user generated content. And uh, the BBC has a huge team actually uh, to deal with that. Uh, and that uh, feeds uh, news, uh, so they do, uh, fact-checked, uh, basically the source of that uh, user-generated content uh, within that team, um, and they feed their correspondence in the field uh, with those um, either images or information, um, and uh, that's definitely something that affects uh, news making and news gathering. Um, that definitely has an, has an impact, and you could basically, as an audience, understand sometimes where it comes from. Uh, they don't usually give um, uh, for instance, when it's an archive, you do see a little bit of small uh, indication that it's an archive, but for user-generated content, 
uh, that's usually not shared if it's taken directly from uh, online uh, because they do get permissions. I mean, these are the technical parts, but I think they're interesting as an audience to know. Um, uh, they do uh, ask permission uh, sometimes to, to use that content. So this is also part of what UGC uh, teams are doing. Uh, and then these contents are used, uh, and that's mainly different from the high quality camera that uh, cameramen use. And you see the drop of the quality immediately. And that's either because the journalist was in a difficult position and used uh, the mobile to film, and that's mobile journalism, which is also pretty much uh, uh, popular, um, right? The heavy equipments are not always possible. and uh, and also that has some uh, budget wise, some reasons uh, are there, uh, so they cannot always send a whole team to the ground, so journalists often are alone, uh, correspondents, so they also film with their phone, and all of these formats are actually quite popular, so it's not only just done because they have to, uh, sometimes you see the drop of quality uh, in, the, in the pictures, but despite that, um, they do that uh, and they don't care if the quality of the images are, are not that so good because that uh, gives you the more immediate information. Uh, it's something that is even now higher pace um, and that's because of digitalization and journalism cannot be uh, exempt from this, from this story um, and they do uh, actually actively try to integrate social media. Social media content becomes news sometimes in itself. Um, and, uh, and the content they do, especially video uh, journalists, uh, two of them I spoke to, um, they are alone in the field doing all of these things, right? So they work for multiple platforms, also within BBC. So the format that they do for as a traditional news package is not usable with uh, mobile uh, phones and what they do is uh, they do a, also smartphone version of it um, with their own camera, mobile um, stuff. And that becomes uh, shareable in social media. So yes, there are um, yeah, some uh, connections there definitely. And uh, the BBC, even though it's a more traditional broadcaster, uh, they feel under tremendous pressure to, to be able to, uh, to be more, uh, yeah, to be able to reach to younger audiences and to, to actually improve their uh, content and more social media friendly and also they feed from social media. Thank you. Thank you for the question. These are all the sites actually results from my research. These are not central, but they did emerge. And not all of these I can use, of course, in, uh, around my arguments. Uh, but uh, yeah, I learned also a lot um, uh, talking to, to, to these uh, senior journalists and uh, understand the BBC a bit better. Any other questions? I can also look at the chat, but I think that's not active after the last message. Thank you so much, Sergul. It's really exciting to think about um, how much you've accomplished in the last 10 years since you were here. And we're very proud of you. And thank you again for sharing your findings and talking to, to us about your journey since Tam. Thank you so much, Sarah, for, for the invitation. And I'm really happy that uh, we had an engaged audience and, uh, and about all these questions. Thank you so much for, for your time, for participating and uh, sharing my special uh, defense state with this. Uh, also visiting uh, lectures. So I'm really happy um, that I, I was able to, to, to share tonight with you for me tonight. <laughs> it's really exciting. I hope you will celebrate all weekend long. Yeah, thank you so much. I will. <laughs> See you. Bye-bye.